I'm Roger Hanlon, a senior scientist at the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole. I'm an ethologist, an animal behavior person uh, by training, and today we're going to talk about uh, this particular subject right here, the adaptive coloration that we find in the cephalopods. In part two, we're going to talk about some of the experimental approaches, but I would like to uh, remind those of you who may not have looked at part one that there we covered some of the general concepts of the system, uh, what part it plays in the bigger picture of predator-prey interactions and so forth. So uh, this is the introduction to what the animals actually do and how we can experimentally test some of the ideas that we presented in part one. So to begin with, you see this cuttlefish underwater, very bright white, very easy to see, and suddenly it makes the decision to disappear, if you will, into the sand, and it scooches in, and it's got the coloration and patterning just right. So the animal started out like this, so there's a dramatic change in appearance. The idea that we want to investigate uh, is how they do this, and in part one I also showed this octopus video that gives the same kind of dynamic. So how exactly do that? In the first part we talked about why they do it, now we're talking about the how questions. So here are some fundamental questions that I'll be able to address uh, in this short presentation. In terms of the pattern, uh, what elicits each of the three pattern types that the animals are capable of showing for camouflage? And I will reiterate those three pattern types in just a moment. And do they prefer certain bottom types to settle on? Even though they have three patterns, can they really go everywhere and still do the camouflage, or do they really go and prefer certain substrates? And what happens when the right eye says to go into one camouflage pattern and the left eye says another? Because these animals have their eyes where our ears are, so they do not have binocular uh, stereopsis that we have as humans. So this is another uh, interesting question. And furthermore, there are three-dimensional objects out there in the real world, not just two-dimensional backgrounds that uh, I will present to you also, like a sandy substrate would be the two-dimensional background, but a rock nearby or a piece of algae or kelp would be the three-dimensional one. How does the animal make the decision of which information to use for its camouflage pattern? Very fundamental question. What about camouflage at night? Something we don't think very much about. Uh, can they really control these camouflage patterns throughout the night under dark conditions? That would require them to see in the dark, and also it means that there are some nocturnal predators, and we know there are a lot of nocturnal predators. How is the skin texture controlled? I've also shown in part one, again, the skin of these animals can morph into 3D. It's really a great feature of camouflage. How did they do this? And how is the posture controlled? It makes a big difference what position, standing, arms stretched, arms in. It makes a big difference in terms of camouflage, how they do that, how do they control some of that. And what about this idea of colorblind camouflage? Because, as we illustrated in, point, in part one, these animals are colorblind, but their predators are not. And they are able to produce beautifully color-matched patterns for camouflage, yet they themselves cannot see color. So we'll address that question here. Motion camouflage is another thing. We know as animals move, we have motion detectors built right into our eyes. Uh, so how do they protect themselves with camouflage while they're moving? There are a few tricks there. And the other thing is, how do some of their visual predators view this, especially the color patterns, the color aspect of the camouflage pattern? We'll give you a nice recent example of that. So we'll address all these questions very quickly. Uh, but with some experimental data. So to reiterate the three pattern types right here, we've got uh, on the far side the uniform pattern means little to no contrast. I don't care what the color brightness is. Uh, the uh, mottled pattern right here, small scale light and dark splotches of moderate contrast and some repetition of that pattern. And then uh, this crazy looking thing here, disruptive, which is characterized by very large scale, even bright white, high contrast markings, but multiple orientations and scales. And again, the first two operate by looking a lot like the background, resembling features of the background, uh, but this last one not only may give some kind of uh, camouflage in terms of looking a bit like the background, but more importantly, it disrupts the recognizable shape of that animal. So here is the burning question. How do they so quickly look at a background and deploy the right pattern? 
And so we take advantage of a key attribute. These animals have a primary defense of camouflage. They're soft-bodied. Everything in the ocean eats them. So they've got to have some trick, and camouflage is their trick. Now, <clears throat> since we can give them any visual background and they'll try to camouflage, we can develop a laboratory assay to test what kind of visual information influences the resultant body pattern. So here's the concept uh, that we are testing. Essentially, if there really are only three basic camouflage pattern templates, as I just pointed out, then maybe there are as few as just three visual sampling rules they need that would allow them to make the decision in seven tenths of a second, which is what they do. Otherwise, to analyze all the visual information available to them in any scene, they'd need a brain as big as this room. And they'd have a big brain, but it's not that big. So here is the experimental design. Uh, we give the animals visual information, which we can create and control, natural substrates as well as unnatural ones. Uh, the, the animal takes that information into the brain. I can treat the brain as a black box because we can measure what's going in and we can measure what's coming out over here. So temporarily, at least, I don't need to know exactly how the brain does that. That's a, that's a convenience for me. So if you can just assume for the moment that there really are only three pattern types, let's see what kind of information we can get out of that. We give a cuttlefish a uniform background, it does that. Non-uniform background does something different. And a non-uniform background of higher contrast and larger size and sharp edges really forces the animal to morph from uniform to mottle to disruptive. So what are the key visual cues that the animal is using? There aren't too many things different here over to here. They're both checkerboards, but they're a different size and they're a different contrast. And there are a few other features that we've begun to look at in detail. So our basic approach is to study a range of natural marine patterns I'm a diving biologist. We photograph and video things underwater. We have a wonderful library of not only cephalopods, but any animal that camouflages. And we can use um, you know, those to give us an idea of what the range of natural substrates is. And it's enormous, as you might suspect. We can extract from those, however, and we can measure some of the salient background features that we think are driving this camouflage patterning. We can imitate these in their simplest form by making computer-generated pattern just with your home computer, an inkjet printer. We laminate it, put it underwater, put the animals on it, and see how they respond to it. So here we can then test multiple computer-generated patterns on many cuttlefish. This is called a psychophysics approach. It's just a fancy word that means that we take one or two visual stimuli. Uh, we control the number of variables, and we see how they respond to very specific things even some of them as crazy as a checkerboard. And believe me, there are no checkerboards in the ocean. So the idea here is that we have developed this very robust bioassay of a living animal, untethered, happy, and healthy. We put it in a visual background, and we allow it to settle. And here's an example of some of the backgrounds we use, and here are more, and here are more, and we've got hundreds more. We can give them all kinds of backgrounds, but we really only develop those backgrounds when we have a specific question that we'd like to address. So here is one example. Here's the same kind of assay, but in this case, uh, we're going to use some natural materials. And we can take rocks like that, and we can add sand until the sand fills in the cracks in between, so that changes the shadows and it changes the sharp edges to see what effect edges have on the resultant pattern. Or we can go to the psychophysics approach and we can put in low contrast checkerboards or we can do phase reversals and other tricks to the edges of these checkers. Or we can make lots of little checkers that together comprise a single checker and we can see how they handle all those because there are many more edges, but do they perceive those as single edges? And do all those three patterns look more or less the same to the cuttlefish is a basic question. You know, we know that many of these patterns will result in that kind of pattern, a disruptive pattern characterized here by this, uh, this white square. And so uh, there's one example of how we can approach it, just to look at one of the three pattern types, in this case, disruptive coloration. So looking at this image right here, if you look at the, the left image, the animal in the middle is showing a disruptive pattern, and it's also showing a disruptive pattern here on the checkerboard. So, so what are the shared features uh, in those two? And uh, I'll point out right here and right here and here, there are these light areas 
in this immediate vicinity where the cuttlefish can see them. And they're about the same size and contrast as the white square. We call it the white square. It's actually a rectangle. That's a physiological white marking on the animal. They're turning that on along with other disruptive components when they see other light objects of about the same size in the background. And that's what's happening over here in this checkerboard pattern when that white checker is about the size of the white checker uh, on the animal, then they use that as the signal to turn on disruptive coloration. I want to emphasize that this cuttlefish is not trying to look like a checkerboard. It's using one visual cue to turn on a type of patterning called disruptive coloration. Now, we can test that with natural substrates, as you see here. So you notice the cuttlefish here, disruptive pattern, disruptive pattern, the white square is still on. So all of these are disruptive patterns. And it turns out that they're in response to these backgrounds here that have light and dark markings and have some white markings that are about the size of the animal's white uh, square. But in the next three images, the disruptiveness disappears. And we can, I'm not gonna go into how the, the axes grade camouflage, but you can read some of our papers later on. But the point is they've gone from disruptive to not disruptive by getting rid of the objects on the background. So we tested this a little more thoroughly in the following paradigm in which we now have just some sandy substrates and we put on in one, okay, there's only sand here, so the animal's uniform. Here we have dark rocks on sand and here we have light rocks on sand because over here we had light and dark rocks and we didn't know which color rock or which brightness of rock was causing the disruptiveness. And in fact you see the answer uh, rather easily because there's the difference in the threshold over there and on the right in the, in the red box you see the threshold here. Clearly the animals with a black rock are not showing disruptive, and with the white rock, they are. And I want to point out that the contrast between the black rock and the sand and the white rock and the sand is exactly the same, even though it may not look like it. We measured it with spectrometers. So this is clear evidence that it is the light object on the background that is driving the disruptive coloration uh, in this case. So there it is. So, we can develop algorithms uh, to look at this in more detail. I'll summarize a large number of experiments very quickly and painlessly for you. And that is that the area of lightness in the background has to be about the same area or size as the animal has on its back. The number and density. You don't need very many white objects in the background to turn on this disruptiveness. We so can be anywhere from two or three to a few hundred. We've tested them all. Uh, the contrast is very important. It all has to be high contrast in this case because disruptive coloration uses high contrast as part of the visual trickery that's going on. So I put this little picture uh, right here. That's not a real experiment. We've got two formulas of contrast. There's Weber contrast, there's Mickelson contrast. There are several ways to measure contrast in the visual world and that makes a big difference in how you design your experiment. We're trying to understand visual perception. Um, so the overall brightness of the background will influence the disruptiveness. The edge characteristics, they have to have sharp edges in the background or they don't pay attention and will not turn on disruptiveness. The various spatial frequencies and even the global context, which is to say if there are a bunch of tiny little white glops, if they're perceived as a single white blop about the size of their white square, they'll turn it on too. So we have done experiments in all of these. Um, and it gives us an idea of how the eye is acting as a sensor of a complicated background to come up with one general answer, and that is disruptive coloration. And there's more work to do on this. I'm not going to present uh, the same kinds of experiments and information we've done on mottled coloration or uniform, because I just want to make the point here and not bore you with too many details. So here is something that is really unusual though. So up here I've got this word ontogeny and the real question is this. If you're a little cuttlefish the size of my little fingernail here when you hatch out, they're looking at a certain white object because their white square is little because they're little. What happens when they get this big and this big and this big? Are they always looking for the same size rock in the background? So we tested this right here. And in this case, when the animal was very small, just a centimeter and a half or so in size, uh, we gave it a series of checkerboards from small squares all the way down to bigger ones at the bottom. 
And then when the animals were a little bigger, 10 centimeters, we did the same test. And when they got up to 19 centimeters, we did the same test. We actually did many more all the way up to full adult size like this. So we went from little guys to big guys. And the answer turns out right here, you see in all these images all the way across, this is the disruptive coloration, is always turned on when the white checkerboard here is about the size of the white square in the animal. So that's kind of cool. It means that one rule works for all sizes of the animal. But the real question is, how do they relate the size of the white square out there with the white square on their back? Because they can't see on their back. So this is not a closed feedback loop. So this is one of the many mysteries, but the experiments are extremely clean. And so they can do it. We just aren't smart enough to figure out how. All right, here is posing a new question. Even though they can show three patterns and go anywhere, do they maybe still have a preference for certain ones? Maybe they're better at disruptiveness and that works better against predators, so they look for backgrounds in which they can be disruptive. This is a question that one might ask. So we, we tested this. Uh, I will say that the tests are based on a lot of our field work in which we've spent um, hundreds, thousands of hours underwater uh, seeing these animals do their uh, camouflage trick, and we've never seen them show a preference. They seem to go absolutely wherever uh, they're foraging or whatever takes them. Nevertheless, we want to test it in the laboratory. So up here, we've got two experimental chambers. This one up here shows um, artificial substrates like the checkerboards and so forth that I showed you, and then we also did natural substrates. And we put the animal in right in the middle in the center channel right here, and then uh, gave it a chance to swim into either of the chambers that they wanted. Here are the experimental results, and over here on the left, this is for the artificial substrates here, you see in these numbers here that they were equally likely to go to any of the backgrounds. They did not prefer any of them. Uh, on the natural substrates down here, you get the same thing. You get roughly equal numbers of all substrates. So this was a statistically sound um, experimental design. Um, and it's clearly showing, at least in the laboratory, no preference whatsoever for different substrates. I will point out that uh, in the one here with the sand, when we gave them real sand, they do prefer to bury a little bit in the sand. So uh, with um, some depth to sand, they will prefer that a little bit. But in general, there's very little evidence for preference of backgrounds. The next question is what happens when left eye gets one form of input and the right eye gets another. As I pointed out, their eyes are where our ears are. They don't have stereo vision. So we created, uh, with the help of a very uh, bright graduate student, uh, this unusual design here where <clears throat> we took advantage of the cuttlefish's propensity to sit near a wall. So we just converged the two walls so it would back itself into the corner. And that way, we could then present different visual stimuli to the left and the right eye. So a very simple ethological observation turns out to be useful in the experiment. And of course, th there was a wall in this chamber too. So they had not only the 2D, but the wall and the 3D information available to them. So what happened? Well, when we put the animals in, in this case right here, uh, on both sides, you know, the left side and the right side, it was all uniform. They showed a uniform pattern. When we gave them a small checkerboard and it was uniform, uh, they showed model and the same with disruptive. So those are our controls. We know that they'll do that. Now, <clears throat> we can measure those patterns. I can't just say that's model or that's disruptive. Uh, we've actually graphed out a lot of these right here. And on point one down here, that is the type of graph that you get when you measure spatial scale against contrast. That's a uniform pattern. Uh, dot ii is a model pattern, which is a characteristic thing. And then you get this disruptive pattern. So that represents the three you see at the top here. Now we give them uh, different information on either side. So right here we have uniform on one side and big checkers here. Down here we have small checkers and big checkers. And here we have small checkers and we have <clears throat> no checkers at all. So left eye and right eye are getting very different information in those cases. And those results are shown down here in the solid lines. And the interesting thing is that they take information from both eyes, they integrate that information, and they put on a little bit of a hybrid pattern that incorporates, uh, let's say, uh, in this case, a little bit of disruptiveness with a lot of model as well. 
So they never ever put on one thing on one side of the body and one on the other because predators would pick that up visually very easily. So in fact, what happens is that these cuttlefish are responding to cues from both sides of the split substrate, that is, both eyes. This is what brains are for. All right, let's move on and talk about a little serendipity. Years ago, we had uh, someone drop a pebble in our tank with our little baby cuttlefish. And it was a joke in the lab because everyone said, well, look at that stupid cuttlefish. He swam away from the wall. Cuttlefish always like to be over against a wall. They swam all the way out in the middle and sat next to the rock. So the bad joke in the lab was stupid cuttlefish. Then later on in the afternoon, someone said, well, maybe there's something magical about that rock. So we finally did some experiments. What we did was we put a cuttlefish in a sandy substrate like this, and then we put a rock in there. And when we put the rock in, the cuttlefish swam next to the rock and deployed a disruptive pattern because the whiteness gave it the signal uh, to turn on disruptive coloration. Here we put the animal in the substrate to let it go mottle. We put the same rock in, all the animals swam over and displayed disruptiveness. You've seen a little of this already, right? And so obviously the animals are attracted to the rock and the rock is eliciting a different pattern, again, from 80 or 90% of the visual field. So we did these experiments, sort of the psychophysics approach by using artificial substrate. There's a uniform background. Now we put in a cube. That's a three-dimensional cube sitting in there. And since the checkerboard's about the same size uh, as the white square in the animal, the animal's putting on a disruptive pattern. Now we put in small checkers uh, and it goes mottle. We put in uh, the large checker three-dimensional cube. It goes disruptive. Now we send it to this very difficult, almost psychedelic background of checkers everywhere. It makes a human dizzy to look in that, by the way. And the animal puts on this really quite thorough and spectacular disruptive pattern using all 11 components. But now we put in a small cube to say, will it go back to the mottle pattern? Go sits next to it and turns on mottle. So this would suggest that there's some priority of the three-dimensional object in the background over the two-dimensional flat surface that they're looking at. But there's a fly in the ointment, which is that this response right here was not completely robust. It wasn't completely consistent. And it turns out that the contrast between this background and that background uh, can make some difference. So this is not the cleanest of answers here. But the three-dimensionality uh, really is playing some key role in their decision for their pattern. All right, what about at night? Uh, humans are terrible at night. We don't see almost anything. We're not adapted uh, at night. And the question is, what do these animals do at night? So in our field work in Australia, this is the giant Australian cuttlefish, it actually gets quite large. These uh, bottom six images uh, show uh, animals in beautiful camouflage throughout the night. So we, we published a short paper on that, and the data we got were right here. Uh, out of 70 some animals, they were either in disruptive or mottle, and a few were in uniform. But the point was that in every little microhabitat that the animals were found, they had a beautifully tailored camouflage pattern, uh, suggesting rather strongly that their vision was good at night and that they were using the same rules during the day and at night. All right, so that was interesting, but it also begged a real question, can they actually change at night? Because we did our study at night and just took snapshots, so to speak, of the pattern. So in the laboratory, we did some experiments and we really tested this. So if you go from left to right over here, uh, we're going from different light sources, light all the way down to full darkness. So this is a stable pattern. So from three in the afternoon with natural light, starting over here, all the way to seven or eight at night as the light dims, the animals are maintaining their pattern as darkness comes. So that's point number one, they're not changing. It still doesn't answer the question we're after, all right? So what we did then was uh, late at night, now all these lines here at the bottom represent all that transition from light to dark. And then in the dark, we switched the pattern dramatically in this case from a uniform to a disruptive pattern, and the animal immediately switched into a strong disruptive pattern. So it means that under full darkness, this was 0.003 lux, that's starlight, 
You and I can't see anything under that light that looks like pitch dark to us, but the animals can perceive that background and they deploy the new camouflage pattern. And this is another example from two different backgrounds when, you know, here's before and here's after they do the switch. So clearly they're capable of seeing a night and deploying uh, the different patterns for camouflage under full darkness. And of course, starlight only, maybe you can add maybe some clouds, but that's pretty dark. Moonlit night's much brighter. So the next thing to talk about is that three-dimensional morphing skin that you saw uh, earlier in part one. And just to refresh your memory, there's the octopus before and after. Get out of the way here. And in between, it goes through several stages of smooth to three-dimensional texture. So the piece of skin there and there and there are all very different. They go smooth to very, very bumpy. Now we know that a lot of cephalopods uh, can show these papillae, they're called. There's a lot of variety of these, and they can control all of those. They can go from smooth to all three-dimensional, kind of spiky and so forth. Uh, and we wanted to do uh, this basic thing, ask whether or not this is driven visually, or can they touch the bottom, feel how three-dimensional rough it is, and then change the skin accordingly. So this is a basic question. So here's a cuttlefish, and um, uh, Justine Allen led this study and she counted all the papillae. That was an onerous task to begin with. And then she characterized them all and created the following experiment. She made a real substrate and on that real substrate the animals had three-dimensional information and they had the tactile information. They could actually touch it and we saw what they did. And the next iteration right here, in this case, uh, we had a piece of glass over the top, so we took away the tactile, but we left the three-dimensional information. And in the bottom, right here, what we did was we did a photograph of the same background, so we took, around, took away the tactile information, and we took away uh, the three-dimensional visual information to see what the animals would do. Now at the bottom, believe it or not, that's a cuttlefish, and it's looking from the side, and you can see there are bumps all over the place. All right, so here are the results. It doesn't matter. Uh, whether uh, you use the actual with the glass or the photograph, in all three conditions, the animals are showing all three pattern types. So we're getting the same response in all of them. And the real data are shown here. And here you see uh, the layout of in each of the three conditions, we grade how much of the pattern type there is, and it's all the same in all three. But that proved the point of the experiment that they are using vision. They're not touching the background to get to three dimensionality. But <laughs> this was a bit of a surprise because in the disruptive patterns, uh, we're only deploying half the number of papillae. So uh, maybe we learned something from this experiment and that is that disruptive patterns and how they optically deceive a predator may not need or utilize that three dimensional skin texture. That's just an idea that came out of this experiment. All right, uh, the next thing was to look uh, at these uh, examples of all the papillae and a big surprise came out of it in terms of neural control of the brain of papillae. It's not like the brain has one motor center, one set of command neurons that turns all the papillae on or off. Uh, Justine and her colleagues found nine independently controlled sets of papillae in the skin. This is complicated and it also goes to point out that this visual control uh, is complicated and important to really fine tune the three dimensionality of the skin in addition to the overall visual patterning that's going on. Okay, uh, a little question that fell out of that is the following thing. I mentioned earlier about eyes where your ears are. <laughs> so if you're looking with one eye at something, your three dimensional capability is reduced significantly. And this is what the cuttlefish are doing. So how might they be looking monocularly at a background, picking up this fine three-dimensionality in the skin and transferring that into their skin. This is really quite an unusual capability and we really don't have any uh, good data or ideas on how that works yet. Now, let's uh, take you diving for a minute. Uh, this is the giant Australia cuttlefish. And you see all these spiky papillae up here on the top, and there are small papillae down on the front of the animal. Look at these papillae here. Some raise up, and they say some go down. And you can see that it's changing all the time from smooth skin to three-dimensional. 
Uh, that is a dramatic example of a very large set of papillae. Here you have more examples of it, just the fine tuned up, down. And look at the papillae over the eye. Here it's periscope down right there. And you'll see more examples in this video. Watch these, Oop, right there. So a lot of these are just showing, here they're gonna pop right up in a moment. The animals have beautiful control of these and you notice that this is just not you know, one simple bump, this is a tri-lobed flat papilla. And so the musculature in this must be quite interesting. We've not really looked at that until recently and uh, we have graduate students and others looking at that capability. Again, you see uh, the, the papillae are expressed up. Now they go down as the animal moves. Here we'll see a little more of that. Look down on the sort of the cheek down there. You can see those. So these papillae are positioned to be viewed from the side, from the top, from every direction because predators come from all those directions. Now again, here this last bit, you'll see that the papillae are well expressed and then the animal moves along, decides not to have rough skin, and has this beautiful smooth skin. And there's no evidence of the presence uh, of those papillae that you just saw out here. So we're beginning to look at how these work, and we really can report on that in the future, hopefully. Now, there's a, another component of camouflage shown right here. Believe it or not, that's a cuttlefish. And instead of just getting down and doing this, it's doing this kind of thing and it's got the arms straight up. And we noticed in the field that when the animals were near three-dimensional structures, they oftentimes would deploy several of their eight arms to create postural camouflage as well. So we tested that in the laboratory. And here we put the animal in the tank and we put a, a terrible facsimile, a piece of green plastic algae in the tank. And again, the cuttlefish swam from the wall, came all the way over, sat next to it and raised its arms. So we did it with a different background. The animal did the same thing, but now we did a photograph, which is a two-dimensional representation of that vertical object, and the animals came all the way across the tank, sat next to it, and they put their arms up. Well, we took this to the extreme uh, by uh, putting the animals on these broad stripes, and now we have uh, a little ring around here, and it's all black. So the animal's putting on some, some broad stripes there. Now, on the wall right here, we're putting these same stripes on the wall and they're going you know, all the way around and the animal flattens itself and here it's pushing its arms way out. Now we change the pattern on the wall to vertical stripes. Notice these are vertical now, not horizontal. And the animal takes its arms and puts them straight up in alignment with the, with the stripes. And then we do the following trick to 45 degrees and zap they just lower them right down to 45 degrees. So we've got visually guided arm postures. Here's some real data from the experiments. Uh, again, uh, no stripes whatsoever. The arms are just flattened down. Vertical stripes, they raise the arms just a little bit <laughs> from the bottom instead of being on the bottom here. Uh, we go to 45 degrees and you can see the arm go up right here. And then we go to 90 degrees and they go straight up. So here's some actual data and you can see the plots, really it's the difference here uh, and here, that's between horizontal and 45. So it's quite precise, really, and a little bit surprising that these animals are looking at all these features, including the vertical structures and even getting the relative positioning of the arms uh, to achieve the camouflage that they want. All right, so what about this really interesting vexing question of colorblind camouflage? I've mentioned earlier that camouflage has to be color coordinated because most predators have color vision. However, I'm gonna show you experiments here, uh, summarize them anyway, that indicate that the cuttlefish and the octopuses and the cephalopods in general are colorblind. So how do they achieve a color match when they can't perceive color? Well, <clears throat> are they really colorblind? That's point number one. Uh, here's an example of an octopus uh, sitting out in the ocean somewhere and where is Waldo? Uh, Waldo is <clears throat> right here, that's the octopus. And it's not the camo I want you to pay attention to, but the amber coloration uh, is really perfectly matched uh, to that piece of algae that it's sitting on. So I have many pictures we could show you about this color match and it's, it's really very good. Um, but what about their ability to see color? So there's a, there's a lot of information indicating that they can't see color. First of all, they've only got one pigment 
in their eye. We have three, RGB, red, green, blue. All these monitors you're watching are all tuned to RGB for our vision. But these animals don't have red, green, and blue. They only have one. It happens to be in the bluey green. Uh, they only have one cell type. They don't have rods and cones like we do. Um, physiologically, if you do an electroretinogram and you change wavelength, there's no Purkinje shift as there is in a, in a color perce perceiving animal. And the behavioral evidence is, is really good because if you do an, an optomotor test, that is, if you put them in this drum and you rotate that drum, uh, the animals will follow that and there'll be a vestibular ocular response. But if you put these uh, yellow and purple or any two colors you want and you get them exactly the same brightness so that the only difference between them is the wavelength or color, the animals do not respond to this whatsoever. So this is a very powerful uh, behavioral assay. Uh, there's some learning experiments that have been done too. The point is that the published literature uh, gives no clue to these animals being able to perceive color by standard measures as we know in biology today. Well, um, so we did the following uh, experiment. We decided to test it again because we didn't believe it either, even though we'd done some of that work. So we know up here that if you put the cuttlefish in a checkerboard that they show this disruptive coloration. So he said, okay, uh, in, in the black and white world, that's what it looks like to us. This animal only has one visual pigment. It's 492 nanometers. That's roughly this color here. So we think that this might be more or less how the animal sees it. It might be the black and white because they only see some shades of green. The point is they can see that checkerboard. Probably, this checkerboard probably looks a bit like that to them, and they turn on this disruptive coloration. So the experiment is quite different. We're going to create yellow and blue checkers. Uh, and the question is, does it look like that to them if we get these really to equal each other exactly in brightness? And we did that. We measured it. And the question is, what, is, what does the animal do? So uh, here are all the measurements. And the reason we p picked uh, yellow and blue is that here, right here is 492 nanometers. That's the peak sensitivity of their single visual pigment. So we went on either side of that here and there, so we got a maximum overlap. So we gave them the best possible chance to see these colors, if you will. And uh, we measured these very carefully. As a control, we put an animal in an all yellow background and it looks uniform, they put on a uniform pattern. All blue background right here, uh, that looks uniform and they put on a uniform. And then we gave them the yellow and blue background and they put on a uniform background because clearly they can't see those checkerboards. So this was another kind of test that seems compelling, but the vision science community uh, would argue that that's not the most compelling experiment. So we did the following experiment. And that is, up here you see 16 checkerboards. And uh, one of the checkers in each one of these is their primary sensitivity to 492 nanometers. So we know that that one color all the way across all 16 here, they have the peak sensitivity to see that. And then, starting way over here with pure white, all the way over here to black, the other checker ran through 16 grayscales. And here are all the backgrounds of what they really look like. So the hypothesis was that was the following. Uh, when we start over here, we got the black and the green. It's going to be high contrast. The animal's going to show some disruptiveness. Way over here on the other side, where it's white and green, they'll be able to see that. The idea is that it converges right into that middle substrate right there, is that at some point in time, those two checkers are going to be the same brightness. And when they are, we would predict the animal here is not going to show any disruptiveness, unless they do have color vision. That would be a different story. So here are the data. Uh, and these really are the data. You see, I'm, I'm, I'm swimming in cuttlefish now. These are the real numbers. And over here, you've got lots of disruptiveness. And over here, you've got a lot of disruptiveness. But right behind me, all right down in here, all the disruptiveness has disappeared. So we've did this to many animals. Just wanted to show you some, some raw data in the form of calamari. And here are the real data sets. And so uh, when everyone brought the data into me the first time, I thought it was a joke. It looked like they got it out of a textbook. It looks too perfect. Uh, the idea here is that right in the middle, right at substrate 7, 8, and 9, the animals were showing a minimum. This is a grade of disruptiveness. When they got down here to that middle bit, indeed, like the prediction, they could not see 
the light and the dark or the grayscale and the green checker at all. And it was a uniform pattern to them. So this is pretty good information showing that they really are not able to perceive color. They just can't do it. Uh, however, let's go back to nature and go diving. And here's an octopus preambulating along with a good color match and what we call the moving rock trick. Notice right there when it got to the kelp, it went from a mottled to a uniform pattern and the color match to the kelp was extraordinarily good. Now I've got bright video lights on introducing sunlight and I'm going to turn them off. You can see the light dimming there one side and then the other so that in the end under the natural light at 70 feet which does not have much red in it uh, uh, the color match is very good but I even introduced full spectrum sunlight with my video lights and the color match was still good. So it's going to be hard to convince me that they don't have some active method of assessing color. So it really begs this interesting question of what they can and can't do. All right, so here's the question it begs. Maybe they have light sensors outside of the eye. That's a pretty uh, wild idea. Uh, but we published a short paper on this uh, just a year ago showing that <clears throat> indeed if you go searching around uh, that one retinal pigment, I already told you, it was tuned to 492 nanometers. That's a kind of blue-green part of the spectrum. Uh, the molecule is actually called opsin. It's an opsin molecule, and uh, the gene uh, for that is known. So we did a quick and dirty gene search in the skin of the cuttlefish, and lo and behold, we found it. So the control was right here in the eye. We took it right out of the retina, and of course, there's plenty of opsin there. We know that. Uh, and we checked all these other places. And we got a positive hit down here on the fourth arm. And we got very positive hits on the ventral mantle, which was a big surprise to us. In fact, it's still a big surprise. We don't really know what that means. Uh, but we got a lot of negative hits on the dorsal surface here. But eventually, we got a positive here on the fin. So it shows that <clears throat> the exact same pigment that is tr helping transduce light in the retina is also out in the skin. So that's a powerful notion. It's a suggestive one only. Uh, but <clears throat> we've taken this a little farther and begin to study this. And what we did in a different organism, that was cuttlefish, this is squid, we did uh, an immunofluorescent stain to that opsin molecule. And these little yellow flicks, see all these little yellow blips here and here, the red arrows are showing some of them. The uh, opsin seems to be the distributed throughout the skin where all these small little yellow blips are. But up here, and then also down here, we had this incredible concentration uh, of this molecule showing up. And this happens to be a yellow chromatophore, and that's a yellow chromatophore. Now these animals have yellow, red, and brown chromatophores, only showing up in the yellow chromatophores. So the idea that you got a light sensing molecule concentrated and one of the pigment types that create the skin patterning is very interesting. So it gives us a lead about where to look for this. I can't say anything more about it now. We've um, just begun to study this in earnest, uh, but stay tuned because it looks as though there might be some light sensing capability in the skin. Now, that doesn't solve the problem of color blindness because if you're uh, following me, I've only talked about the same single, single pigment, uh, and you have to have two pigments to discern color and we so far have only one. But at least now we can look for other options in the skin tuned to a second wavelength. Or it's very interesting here that it happens to be co-located with a yellow pigment. So now we have a green sensing molecule and we have a yellow filter potentially. Uh, so there might be a way, that could be a dichromatic way of discriminating a little bit of color. There are a few cases out there in biology similar to that. Anyway, it poses an interesting question, and we'll have to see where this takes us. All right. Now, I want to switch gears because we're finishing up now and talk about motion camouflage. Uh, right here, you see an octopus. That is an octopus, believe it or not, sitting on a piece of coral uh, in French Indo-Pacific um, Indo Islands. And the camo is very good. But eventually, animals have to move. They just can't stay still. And so one way of achieving camouflage uh, when you move is what this animal is going to show you right now. And uh, here you see what we call the moving rock trick. And the case here will be uh, a reef in which the octopus is right here and it's slowly but surely moving away from that rock. And notice that 
it's really holding its posture, color, and pattern. But notice how slowly it's moving. In fact, its movement does not stand out from the other movement in the visual background. All these waves generated by the sun and ripple are creating false motion in the background. And the animal is moving at a rate that doesn't stand out from that rate of movement. So it's not setting off the motion detectors in the predator's eye is the way one might interpret that. So this is really some cognitive action going on in the brain of this animal. It's not only uh, getting its pattern and everything else right for the coral that it came off of it, but it's, it's holding itself up in this body and it's tippy-toeing across the substrate like this, holding all this still. That's a very athletic move. And it's gauging its speed according to the light movement in the background. Now on a calm day or a cloudy day, when you didn't have all this false motion, the animal's taking 20 minutes to cover the same distance that it covered in 20 seconds on this. So these animals have got some other tricks up their sleeve. Uh, again, another good use of a rather large, complicated brain. All right, so to wrap up, the ultimate goal in this sort of work is to try to understand camouflage patterning, the control of that patterning, and how it depends on the visual information available to the animal and its immediate surrounds. So that, as in any system in biology or science, if you understand all sides of it, you can begin to predict what the animals are going to do. So with our algorithms for the three pattern types, we can begin to look at backgrounds a little bit and start to look at the background and think about what is it the animal is looking for. We should be able to get some general prediction about at least what kind of pattern it's going to turn on, uniform, modular, disruptive. But eventually we have to work out these other aspects of the posture and the fine tuning of that pattern. So there are many challenges in front of us, but we've certainly got uh, a new view of it uh, based on the lovely cephalopods giving us the chance to test them in the laboratory. Now, the one final thing about predators and, and how they may look at these patterns. So uh, if you look at this image uh, right up here, this is taken in the RGB space of a typical camera that we all use. And in that case, uh, there's actually a cuttlefish right there. And the camouflage is very good. And to give a human a perspective on what that looks like, we use the old driver test, the driver's license test that you use. And you know, if you're, unless you're colorblind, you'll see the number five right there. So that's what it would look like in the RGB space. Now, we took these images over here with some very new technology, a hyperspectral camera, hyperspectral imaging. Uh, these cameras are new, they're expensive, but they have the beauty that instead of having a camera with only you know, red, green, and blue with three spectra, uh, we can have hyperspectral and we can have uh, any number of the 300 wavelengths that we can see between 400 and 700 nanometers in the visible range, we can tune those into the camera. So every pixel in our image now has 100 or 200 of the 300 possible colors that are available to our visible uh, range. So that's what these images are. And now what we did is we created two hypothetical predators, one that has a dichromat two pigments, another one that has three, and then we went here and we gave an impression of what those predators would see in this image given their specific uh, capabilities for color. And you can see the dichromat here did not see, <laughs> you and I can't see, that number any longer. The trichromat, at least the spectra that we picked, you know, the, the three color sensitivities we picked out, could see the five, not quite as well as you and I see it on the RGB, but they could see it. So the point is, with two hypothetical predators, this dichromat, this particular fish, is colorblind to that cuttlefish. It can't see the cuttlefish using the color information only. Cuttlefish is hard to see anyway, but we subtracted out all the color and images I won't bore you with, and they just can't, you know, it's just not available to them. So, and of course, a monochromat can't see any of this. So uh, that was a great new tool that's coming along, which I think will allow us uh, to study this aspect of camouflage much more quantitatively. More importantly, from the sensory biology point of view, we can begin to view the world in the eyes of the predator. And this new technology is going to allow us to do that. And it's, uh, it's just coming right now uh, in 2011. So hopefully this will change 10 years from now and give you a lot more information. OK, let me provide a few concluding ideas. 
uh, this dynamic camouflage obviously is controlled visually. I've given you multiple examples of that. Uh, although the cephalopod eyes kind of look a lot like our eyes, they're really very different by several features. Um, they can't see a lot of the things that we can, like color. Uh, but most importantly, I think, is this. We now have what we'll call this fancy term a visual sensory motor assay. That is, we've got live, healthy, untethered cuttlefish responding to this visual information to see how they turn on their camouflage pattern types. Uh, if you're still arguing with me about three basic camouflage pattern types, I will say that after thousands of experiments in the last seven years in our lab, uh, we still have not seen patterns outside of these three or four basic pattern types. So it's beginning to hold, nor have we seen it in our extensive field work. Uh, two more points, and that is there's a lot of future work still to be done on this and related systems. Uh, I've told you how the basic pattern type is put out there, but we know very little about the fine-tuning variations of each of those pattern types. And then finally, there are these really <laughs> interesting, vexing questions about colorblind camouflage and that 3D skin texture. Those are uh, major challenges to vision research. So with that, I'd like to close again with one of my favorite sayings. It's over the door in the library at the Marine Biological Laboratory, and it's been there since uh, the 1890s by the then director or trustee, Louis Agassiz. So thank you for your attention. Uh, in part three, I will be talking about the skin itself and how the skin actually implements all these optical illusions, and that will be uh, the sequel. Thank you very much.